Good morning, dear children. Welcome back. In today's session, we are going to discuss Class Seven, Term Two, Unit Two in History, the Mughal Empire. This is Part Five of the series. Come, dear children, let us learn. Before moving on to today's session, let us have a recap of what we learned in the last sessions. Dears, in the last sessions, we discussed about the Mughal Empire. We learned that a new empire began in India with the arrival of the Mughal king Babur. Except for the brief reign of Shah Shah of Sur dynasty, the Mughal rule lasted from AD Common Era 1526 to 1707. These were the years when the fame of the great Mughals of India spread all over Asia and Europe. Babur was the founder of the Mughal Empire in India. He inherited Fargana, a small kingdom in Central Asia, when he was twelve years old, but he was soon driven out from there by the Uzbeks. After ten years of adversity, Babur established himself as a ruler of Kabul. In Kabul, Babur set his sight eastward. He led his first expedition towards India. Following the tradition set by Chinggis Khan, who nominated the most deserving among his sons as his heir, Babur chose his favorite and eldest son Humayun as his heir. Humayun, on his accession to the throne, divided his inheritance as per his father's will, and accordingly, his brothers Kamran, Hindal, and Askari got a province each. He had rival Afghan Sher Shah Sur, the ruler of Bihar and Bengal. Sher Shah defeated Humayun at Chausa and again at Kanauj. Humayun, defeated and overthrown, had to flee to Iran. With the help of the Persian ruler Shah Tahpas of the Safavid dynasty, Humayun succeeded in recapturing Delhi in 1555. After the death of Humayun in 1556, his 14-year-old son Akbar was crowned the king. Sher Shah, who had defeated Humayun, was the son of an Afghan noble, Hasan Suri, a ruler of Sasram in Bihar. After overthrowing Humayun, Sher Shah started the rule of Sur dynasty at Agra. He built an empire stretching from Bengal to Indus, excluding Kashmir. Akbar assumed full control of the government and brought most of India under his control. through conquests and alliances he was able to conquer rani durgavadi a ruler of the central province and rani chand bibi a regent of ahmednagar akbar defeated uday singh of mewar and captured the fort of chitur in 1568 and then rana tambur in 1569 in 1576 he won over uday singh's son rana pratap at the battle of haldi ghati Akbar was succeeded by the prince Salem his son through a Rajput wife who was also named Nuruddin Muhammad Jahangir that is conqueror of the world Jahangir was more interested in art and painting and gardens and flowers rather than in running the government so Jahangir's wife Mehru Nisha also known as Nur Jahan was a real power behind the throne The toleration of religions of Akbar's time continued in Jahangir's time but Jahangir ordered the execution of Sikh leader Guru Arjan for helping his rebellious son Khusru who contested for the throne this resulted in a prolonged fight between the Sikhs and the Mughals the Mughals had to lose control over trade routes of Afghanistan Persia and Central Asia the loss of Kandhar exposed India to the invasions from the northwest Ahmednagar though conquered by Jahangir remained a source of trouble throughout his reign. Jahangir granted trading rights to the Portuguese and later to the English. Thomas Roe, a representative of King James I of England, visited Jahangir's court and this agreement paved the way for the British establishing their first factory in Surat. Prince Khurram after a struggle for power succeeded Jahangir as Shah Jahan, king of the world. Shah Jahan ruled for 30 years. He led a campaign against Ahmednagar and annexed it in 1632. Bijapur and Golconda were also conquered later. 
Shah Jahan fell ill in 1657 and a war of succession broke out among his four sons. Aurangzeb emerged successful after killing his three brothers Dara, Suja and Murad. Shah Jahan passed in the last 8 years of his life as a prisoner in the Shah Burj of Agra Fort. Aurangzeb, the last of the Mug great Mughals, started off his reign by imprisoning his old father. He assumed the title Alamgir, that is a conqueror of the world. He reigned for 48 years. He was no lover of art like his grandfather Jahangir and architecture like his father Shah Jahan. He never tolerated any religion other than Islam. Aurangzeb's hostility towards Rajputs led to prolonged wars with them. To make matters worse, his rebellious son Prince Akbar joined the force of Rajput and created troubles to him. Prince Akbar entered into a pact with Shivaji's son Shambhuji in Deccan. So Aurangzeb had to march to Deccan in 1689. Aurangzeb could vanquish Shivaji's son and successor Shambhuji who was captured and executed by him. He remained in the Deccan until his death in 1707 at the age of nearly 90. By the end of Aurangzeb's rule the British had firmly established their trade centers at Madras, Calcutta, Mumbai and French had their main trade center in Pondicherry. Children in this session we will discuss about the Mughal administration. Let us see the important elements and structure of the Mughal administration. The emperor was the representative of God. Mughal emperors considered themselves as God's representative on earth. They claimed to be shadow of God or visible God or wakil to God or katifa of her country. Centralized power the emperor was the head of the administration and the state. He was a lawmaker, dispenser of justice, commander in chief and fountain head of all honors. He was a source of all authority. Benevolent despot Mughal emperor acted two primary duties for themselves protection of state and jahangiri that is extension of empire they attempted to create those conditions which were conducive to economic and cultural progress of their subjects they had foreign come indian system of administration the mughal administration presented a combination of indian and extra indian elements or perso arabic system in indian setting There was always a council of ministers. The Mughal emperor had no regular council of ministers. The wazir or prime minister and the diwan, the finance minister, were the highest persons below the emperor, but the other officers were in no sense his colleagues. Children, the Mughals provided a stable administration in larger parts of India. The emperor was the supreme head of the Mughal administrative system. He was the lawmaker, the chief executive, the commander in chief of the army and the final dispenser of justice. He was a lawmaker, chief executive, commander in chief of the army and the final dispenser of justice. Dear children, although he was the supreme authority, the king was assisted by a council of ministers. The most important officials were wakil the prime minister and wazir or diwan who is in charge of the revenue and expenditure there were other ministers in charge mir bakshi was in charge of the army mir saman looked after the royal household the qazi was a chief judge the sadur us sudar was minister for enforcing islamic law that is sharia So children who were the council of ministers wakil the prime minister wazir or diwan in charge of revenue and expenditure or kind of finance minister mir bakshi in charge of army mir saman looked after royal household qazi chief judge and sadur is sudar minister for enforcing islamic law the islamic law is called as sharia sharia is an islamic religious law that governs the religious rituals but also the aspects of day to day life in islam sharia means 
the way it is a law that is acting as a code of living that all muslims should adhere including prayers fasting donations to the poor it aims to help muslims understand how they should lead every aspect of their lives according to god's wishes children now let us learn about the provincial administration the empire was divided into several subhas or provinces each subha was under the control of an officer called subedar the subhas were further divided into districts called sarkars the sarkars were subdivided into parganas a group of villages or gramas formed a pargana so you have the provincial administration with the subhas or provinces as the uh, at the top followed by uh, so uh, divided into districts called as sarkars sarkars divided into parganas parganas were a group of villages or gramas children so you can see the provincial administration the subhas under the control of subedars on and, and diwan which is divided into sarkars and sarkars divided into parganas and parganas were a collection of villages now we will learn about local administration the towns and cities were administered by kotwals the kotwals maintained law and order dear children the administration of villages were left in the hands of local village panchayats that was the informal institution of justice in the villages like we have our panchayati raj the panchayatdars or the jury dispensed justice the justice was dispensed by the panchayatdars dear children it is time for us to learn more details about the mughal army the mughal army was well organized and reached its zenith during the rule of akbar cavalry was a main arm as it provided greater mobility the artillery were the supporting arms of the mughals the technology tactical surprise that the artillery contributed was unparalleled they used various kinds of weapons the weapons include swords bows and arrows horses camels elephants some of the world's largest cannons muskets flint lock missiles rockets pistols and artillery and the mughal army comprised infantry cavalry war elephants and artillery children infantry i n f a n t r y infantry is an army specialization whose personnel engage in military combat on foot that they fight from fight on their foot cavalry are soldiers who fought on horseback and artillery children is a class of heavy military ranged weapons built to launch mutations far beyond the range and power of infantry firearms it is used to destroy the defensive walls and fortifications during the sieges and they, they created fairly immobile siege engines so the army of the mughal emperors were well equipped it had infantry cavalry it had war elephants as well as artillery the emperor maintained a large number of trained and well armed bodyguards and palace guards there were guards who were bodyguards for the emperors as well as guards for the palaces on the picture dear children you can find the cavalry the gunners the bowmen and the grand bombard then the infantry macemen etc dear children now let us learn about mansabdari mansabdari m a n s a b d a r i mansabdari mansabdari the word mansab is of arabic origin meaning rank or position so mansabdari was a system of ranking the government office officials and determined their civil and military duties along with their remuneration it was a administrative system introduced by akbar in mughal empire during 1571 
So children, Manshabdari system was a grading system used by the Mughal rulers to fix the rank and salary of a Manshabdar. They were nobles who occupied various positions in the administration of the Mughal Empire. They were appointed and dismissed by the Mughal Empire. The officers were called as Mansabdars. They could be transferred from one section to another section, for example from military to civil or vice versa. The power to recruit and promote Mansabdars were in the hands of the Mughal Emperor. The hierarchy was Amir of Amirs, Amir al-Kabir, that is a great Amir and Amir. There were dual representation, that is two representation of Mansab. One is Zat, as well, other one is Sabar. Zat indicated the rank in the administration as well as a salary. Whereas Sabar represented the cavalry rank. That is, it denotes the number of horses and cavalry men maintained by the Sabar. The position of Mansabdar in the hierarchy depended on the Zat. They were classified into third class Mansabdar, second class Mansabdar, and first class Mansabdar. According to this system, the nobles, civil, and military officials were combined to form one single service. Just like our civil services in India, we can say the systems were considering the nobles, civil and military officers were combined to form one single service. Everyone in the service was given a mansab, meaning a position or a rank. So, mansab means position or a rank. Children, a mansabdar was a holder of such a rank. Mansabdar rank was dependent on zat and savar. Zat indicated one's status. Savar was the number of horses and horsemen he had to maintain. So children, Zat meant the status and Savar the number of horses and horsemen he had to maintain. Children, his salary was fixed on the basis of number of soldiers each Mansabdar received and it ranged from 10 to 10,000. These Mansabdars were paid high salary by the emperor. But before receiving the salary, he had to present his horsemen for inspection. The horseman had to be presented for inspection before he received the salary. He was highly paid depending on the number of soldiers each one had. Their horses were branded to prevent theft. So it was branded, some tag or token was given to each of the horses so that it could not be stolen away. Children, the emperor could use the troops maintained by a mansabdar whenever he wished. So they were in, in charge of a troop or a group of soldiers and the emperor could take over the troops whenever he wished. The rank of mansabdar was not hereditary during Akbar's time. During Akbar's time, Akbar was the first one to introduce Mansabdari system and during his time it was not hereditary, it could, it could not be passed on to the next generation. But after Akbar, it became a hereditary. So it was a pride to be a Mansabdar and it was passed on to the next generation. Children, it is time for us to learn about the land revenue administration. Land revenue was a major source of income. Akbar had instituted a system of zapti under which the average produce of different crops and the average prices from the last 10 years were calculated. One third of the average was the share of the state that was mentioned in cash. Land revenue was fixed considering both continuity and productivity of cultivation. After assessing land revenue in kind, Value was converted into cash using price list or dasturul amal prepared at regional level for various food crops. And each of the cultivator got a title for land holding or a patta. The most common type of assessment followed was batai. Batai is crop sharing and it was subdivided into three parts. The first one is reaped and stacked crops. Dividing fields after sowing, division of grain heaps. 
measuring the land by jarb or through pacing and estimating standing crops by inspection a rough calculation of payable amount by the peasant keeping in mind his past experience this land revenue system was initiated by sher sarsur in the beginning akbar followed the policy of land revenue initiated by him during the reign of shesha average value was determined by measuring agricultural land and also determined by the average production of the produce the land revenue system of akbar was prepared while keeping in mind the interest of the people land revenue administration was toned up during the reign of akbar Raja Turdar Mal, Revenue Minister of Akbar, adopted and refined the system introduced by Sher Shah. So the land revenue system followed by Akbar was the one followed by Sher Shah Sir. Turdar Mal Zabt system was put in place in the north and northwestern provinces. So the system was Zabt and it was implemented in the north and northwestern provinces. Dear children, according to Zabt system, after a survey, that is after an estimation, lands were classified according to nature and fertility of the soil. They had a survey and they were dividing the land according to their nature and the fertility of the soil. The share of the state was fixed at one third of the average produce for ten years. So they took the produce for 10 years and the average of that was taken and from that one third was a share of the state so it was a very genuine and a reasonable share it average of 10 years was taken and from that from the average one third was that for the state during the reign of shah jahan the zabt or the sabti system was extended to the deccan provinces children we knew that the zabt system was put in place in the north and northwestern provinces during akbar's reign and during the reign of shah jahan the zabt or the sabti system was extended to the deccan provinces dear children it is time for us to learn about the ikta system Uh, children lands were called as ikta and the holder was called as iktedar or mukti the duty of the iktedars was to maintain law and order and lead military campaigns collect the revenues of their assignments as salary and pay the soldiers and the mughal emperors enforced the old ikta system renaming it as jagir It is a land tenure system developed during the period of Delhi Sultanate. We had already studied this. Under the system, the collection of revenue of an area and the power of governing it were bestowed upon military or civil official now named jagirdars. So the jagirdars had the power of color governing their area as well as the collection of revenue. He was a military or a civil official. Dear children every mansabdar was a jagirdar if he was not paid in cash if he was not paid in cash instead of he was granted land he was called, he was a jagirdar and the jagirdar collected revenue through his own officials he had a system of collecting the taxes and people were there to collect the revenue the amal guzar or the revenue collector of the district I was assisted by subordinate officers so amal guzar was the revenue collector of the particular area and he was assisted by different officers like the portdar kwanungo patwari and mukaddams so these people portdar kwanungo patwari and mukaddams assisted amal guzar in collecting the revenue of the district those appointed to collect the revenues from the landlords were called as zamindars so those people who were entrusted to collect the revenues from the landlords were called the zamindars the zamindars collected taxes and maintained law and order with the help of mughal officials and soldiers so they helped maintaining the law and order 
and with the help of the Mughal officials and the soldiers. So, zamindars collected revenue from the landlords. Dear children, the local chieftains and the little kings were also known as zamindars. And but at the end of 16th century, the zamindars were conferred hereditary rights over their zameen. So they had hereditary rights over their land. The zamindar was empowered to maintain troops for the purpose of collecting revenue. So he had his set of soldiers for collecting the revenue. So he was a small king. The emperor was very generous. He granted lands to scholars holy men and for religious institutions. So, emperor was always granting land to scholars, learned people, to holy people as well as for religious institutions. And these lands were called Suyurgal, S-U-Y-U-R-G-H-A-L, Suyurgal and they were tax free. There was no tax collected to the land gifted to uh, holy men, scholars and religious institutions. So the zamindars acted as uh, local chieftains or small kings and they, they could uh, maintain troops or uh, military people to collect the revenue. And the Zamindari, by the end of 16th century, the Zamindari was a hereditary right. Children, Akbar was very liberal in his religious policy. He was very liberal. He was not very particular about the religion. In Akbar's court, the Portuguese missionaries were great favorites. He even favored the missionaries from Portuguese. We have already learned he had a library having the even the illustration the illustrated uh, version of the holy bible akbar tried to include good principles in all religions and formulated them into one single faith called din ilahi or the divine faith children din ilahi is a religion of god or the oneness of god it is a religion propounded by the Mughal Emperor Akbar and it merged some of the elements of the religions of his empire like the Islam, Hinduism, Zoroastrianism and also Christianity, Jainism and Buddhism. So he included all the good elements from all the religions and formed a religion or God's religion. We already learned that they here had constructed the Ibad Khana or the house of worship at Fatehpur Sikri. Akbar's religious policies, dear children, were followed by Jahangir as well as Shah Jahan. But uh, Aurangzeb rejected the liberal views of his predecessor. He was not very religiously tolerant towards other religions. He favored only the Islam. As we pointed out earlier, he reimposed the jizya and pilgrim tax on Hindus. He imposed the tax jizya which was eliminated as well as a pilgrim tax on the Hindus. His intolerance towards other religions made him unpopular among the people. So he was not very very popular among his people because of his religious intolerance. Before winding up the session, let us have a recap of what we learnt. Children, we learnt in the session about the Mughal administration. We learnt about the central administration with the emperor as a supreme head. He was a lawmaker, chief executive, commander-in-chief of the army and the final dispenser of justice. There were various council of ministers like the Wakil or the Prime Minister, Wazir or Divan in charge of revenue that is the Finance Minister, Mir Bakshi in charge of the army, Mir Saman, Royal Household, Kwasi the Chief Judge and Sadr Us Sudar enforcing the Islamic law. We learned about the provincial administration containing Subhas controlled by the Subedar or Divan, Sarkars, Parganas and villages. The army was well equipped with the infantry, cavalry, war elephants as well as artillery. Akbar introduced the Mansabdari system. According to this system, the nobles, civil and military officials were combined to form one single service. Mansab meaning a rank or a position. The land revenue administration was followed by Akbar 
on the footsteps of Sher Shah Sur. They followed a sub the system. That is, after a survey, lands were classified according to the nature and fertility of the soil, and the share of the state was fixed at one third of the average produce for ten years. We also learned about the religious policy of the Mughal emperors. We learned that they were, even though they were followers of Islam, few of them were very had a very liberal outlook towards the religions. Akbar tried to include all the good principles in all religions and formulated them into one single faith called Din Ilahi. Jahangir and Shah Jahan also followed the policies of Akbar, except for Aurangzeb, who was not very liberal, and he was not very popular among the people. Dear children, in the next session, we will discuss about art and architecture of the Mughal Empire. That's all for today's session, my dears. Thank you for watching the class. Please subscribe and share our YouTube channel for Samachir Kalvi classes. YouTube.com/slash Samachir Kalvi Guide. Thank you, children, and stay blessed.